I did this. Okay, everybody, we took a look at what ski areas are doing to adapt to climate change. Hopefully the temperature in this room can give you a little sense of the future conditions we're anticipating. Um, so I know we aren't looking at what ski areas did to mitigate climate change. That's usually what you hear of when you think of sustainability initiatives that ski areas do, is like recycling and reducing emissions. But we are specifically looking at how they're adapting their business models to decrease the snowpack in the future. So these, this is a picture of some of the unfortunate conditions we might be seeing in the future. And our research question or <laughs> our presentation is what is the United States ski industry doing to adapt to climate change and how can these efforts inform our local resorts? So, um, like I said before, we're kind of interested in business model adaptation, how that can be done in a way that doesn't continue in uh, adding to greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll end with some recommendations for our local resorts. So to kind of gather this information, we conversed through email and phone with these different organizations um, from ski areas to um, kind of organizations supporting ski areas. And you notice we also reached out to a couple resorts on the West Coast since they're already dealing with some of these severe impacts from drought that we're anticipating. Okay, so I'm going to go over a little bit of the, the current state of the industry. So um, this is a map from a report that was produced from Protect Our Winners um, in a 2012 report and it follows the 2009-2010 season. Um, I just want to make a quick note. You saw in the list that Erin put up, we kind of looked at three different distinct groups that are engaged in the ski industry. That's ski resorts themselves, it's also ski industry associations, as well as this third party environmental advocate. It's an interesting dynamic because while they're an environmental advocate, they're also explicitly committed to the snow sports industry, so they're very engaged in seeing its success. Um, so this is the report was produced by them, Protect Our Winners Pal. So what this map is showing is jobs created by the winter tourism industry in the U.S. Um, overall, there's 38 states that experience value-added um, economies from downhill skiing, snowboarding, and snowmobiling. Um, additionally, there's just about 60 million skier and snowboard visits a year to both ski resorts and ski areas nationwide. Um, that equates to about 211,000 jobs annually, um, as well as $7 billion in salaries, and um, in terms of that effect on our economy, that's $1.4 billion in state and local taxes, and just about $2 billion in federal taxes. So um, if you take a look at Colorado here, uh, we have almost 38,000 jobs created by the winter tourism economy. Um, we, because of that number, we are the largest ski industry in the country. We have the most jobs created by the winter tourism economy. Um, if you look at California as a comparative example, much larger population, but the number is smaller in comparison. So that means that we have a lot to lose in terms of climate change, and we really do need to be proactive in how we're handling things. Um, <coughs> of the numbers. Um, the report does talk about snowmobiling for the purpose of this. We are talking about ski areas and resorts, so we're going to stick to the top area, which is um, the skier numbers, and this just kind of goes over those employment numbers a little bit more. I did want to give you some specific Colorado numbers. Um, I talked about the employees. Uh, the winter tourism is a $1.2 billion industry in Colorado. We have about 12 million skier visits annually as well as 300,000 snowmobile days and $2.2 billion in value added to the Colorado economy. Um, on, years, you can go the next slide. on years where there's low snow, we stand to um, lose about 8% of that value, and that equals about $154 million um, for the Colorado winter sports industry. A note on this, while this research obviously looked at ski resorts, it also looked at things such as restaurants, uh, 
purchase of, equip, of ski equipment, um, accommodation to consider what the total value added of the economic benefit of the ski industry is. Um, this is just another map that pretty much just shows those value additions. Um, and just to kind of wrap up the state of the industry, I wanted to read two specific quotes from two uh, ski area associations. One is the National Ski Area Association, um, and they have instituted something called the Climate Challenge, and they explain that as a voluntary program dedicated to helping participating ski areas reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reap other benefits in their operations, such as reducing costs for energy use. Um, and then the other industry is Colorado Ski Country USA, and they say that their resorts are leading the way in protecting one of Colorado ski industry's most valuable assets for future generations of outdoor enthusiasts. Why this is important is that um, Cassidy will talk about this later, but they're speaking about climate, but they are talking about their efforts towards mitigation of adaptation. Ryan, yeah. Ryan? Fine. <laughs> it's your turn. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> So I'll just quickly, quickly outline some of the current adaptation strategies. Um, as Cassidy pointed out, there is uh, quite a bit of revenue at stake. And so some of the ski resorts are thinking about ways to, to capture um, alternative revenue streams. And you can see we have a picture of a wedding, um, which doesn't necessarily rely on uh, the same level of traditional snowpack that the ski resorts are used to. Um, the other thing that will be required or that people are doing to adapt is to be flexible in their opening dates as well as their options for the pass. And so um, this is just one way that they're adapting is creating new flexibility. And then uh, the bottom left, we know mountain bikers love to also utilize ski resorts. Um, and so this is going to be increasingly important and is important for many ski resorts to attract um, these summer uh, dollars that do not rely on a, uh, on a, on a huge snowpack. Um, and just thinking about how people can access snow that does exist um, on their mountains in ways that, that they haven't before with their ski lifts. Um, and so then moving on to the next slide. when adaptation isn't an option. So some places are able to adapt by making snow. This example uh, here in Yosemite, we have a ski resort called Badger Pass, and they are completely reliant on natural snow. And so they closed on Jan Monday, January 19th this year. So that was a 45-day season um, that they had. And I spoke with their, their representative and they, I asked them if they plan to operate next year, and basically their adaptation strategy is just to hope for more snow. And so they, they are very limited because of environmental protections that are in place. And same thing's going on um, in Mount Baker. They closed in February this year. Um, but they have a historical perspective that uh, this kind of thing has happened in the, in the past. Um, so they, they do have a context for it, and that does help give them hope uh, moving forward. And so those are my slides. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, so we just thought we would give you a feel for what the leaders in the industry are messaging about you know, how, how climate change relates to their businesses. And first, um, the first quote is from the CEO of Vail, uh, Rob Katz. And he, and he says, when folks trying to alarm people with images of melting snow, when the effects of climate change really show up, no one will care about skiing at Aspen and Vail. Let's keep the focus where it belongs and encourage everyone to do their part to reduce greenhouse emissions, not to save their favorite ski run, but to save the planet for our children and grandchildren. And we wanted to contrast that with a quote from um, Adam Schendler from the Aspen Skiing Company, who says, I'm not a bit big fan of the adaptation conversation because you can't adapt to 4 degrees Celsius. So I think this really shows really difference in, in, in opinions. I mean, um, Katz is not really taking, um, 
taking accountability or, or taking responsibility. They're not they're putting it into their business model and they're not really considering climate change and how they're adapting or um, to to the problem. And I think that Schindler is much more pragmatic and he really calls it out. Um, um, now, so with that, uh, we identified some gaps that we thought were pretty um, relevant to this. Um, and the first is mitigation. A lot, as Cassidy already mentioned, a lot of the um, ski resorts really are doing mitigate, are really addressing mitigation in terms of snowmaking, emissions um, reductions, and not everybody, but a lot of them are doing that. And uh, recycling programs, LED lighting, uh, um, lead construction, and that sort of thing. But they're not really addressing the adaptation. And you know, if if their business model doesn't evolve to um, adapt without creating more greenhouse emissions, they're essentially just kind of on the same path and they're still contributing to a melting snowpack. So we feel that there needs to be much more of a marriage between the mitigation and the adaptation in order for things to move forward more smoothly. And there is a lack of cohesion across the industry. Um, as you can see from that last slide, there's sort of differences of how to address things. Um, Although when it comes to mitigation, there is more uh, consistency and sustainability. They are, are messaging that pretty well in their marketing. But uh, that also relates to greenwashing. A lot of the uh, websites that you look at, um, you know, some of our informants are really on the cutting edge and leading edge of mitigation. But um, a lot of other companies are just sort of jumping on the bandwagon and trying to be a part of it. Um, with their recycling program, I think Steamboat was one example where you know they're doing recycling year after year, but they're never really evolving into more mitigation strategies. And pretty much no one's talking about adaptation. They're just sort of falling into it when there's no snow. So we're adapting by having more weddings and having a longer, you know, different seasons. So that's uh, what we found a lot of. And greenwashing was touched on by um, Schindler, who feels that carbon offsets and LED lighting are just not going to be the trick that we really have to pull a bigger lever and talk about policy. So he's really big on policy. Um, and then the last one is partnering on climate action, which, um, you know, just being more collaborative and reaching out to other entities but outside of the ski industry. Um, Arapaho Basin um, that has a really, for a really small ski area, they have a really great model. Um, they actually partner with a local nonprofit uh, called the High Country Conservation Center, and what they do is they have the Snow Hugger Club, and you buy into it, you pay 20 bucks, and you get discounts on all this stuff, and at the same time, all the money from the proceeds goes to the High Country Conservation Center, and they do educational outreach and that sort of thing within the community. So they're kind of branching out. Um, they also partner with uh, Keystone Science School as well as uh, Continental Divide Land Trust. So they're trying to reach out and collaborate more. So those were some of the gaps. You know, and related to those gaps are our recommendations of what, what might need to happen for things to move forward. Um, pretty much, the first is just creating a more industry-wide climate change plan that it sort of marries the adaptation and mitigation pieces. They're pretty disconnected and there's really no adaptation that we can find to speak of, so we felt that, that was needed. Um, also, uh, more of an honesty in communicating. It seems like there's a lot of, there is a lot of greenwashing, but um, people are us, the people that are talking the talk are not uh, necessarily doing anything, so um, there needs to be a little more of that. Um, environmental partnerships, uh, that just in terms of being more collaborative and getting more inclusive and in, in the community so that other people are understanding the messaging and knowing what needs to happen. And then sort of a, an increase in industry congruency, which you know Cass was talking about how. Is that right? Um, and you know they're interested in climate change and economics, whereas you know the National Security Association is focused on mitigation and targeting uh, targeting certain uh, emissions uh, reductions and that sort of thing. And then you have Aspen Ski Company wanting to work on a more policy level. So you've got all these different things going on and not a lot of coming together on how to move forward. So that would be that would be our recommendations. 
and uh, Megan's going to talk a little bit more about local So yeah, I'll talk about the more localized recommendations we have. I'll start here with a quote from John Sale, the Director of Sustainability at CDMR, which is just a little part of his job. <laughs> um, as with most businesses, you, you adapt to the conditions you are given in good years and bad. Winter operations must provide a safe and quality product for our guests that expect certain levels of quality for their stay. With shorter winters and hotter summers, CBMR has become a full season mountain resort. Summer is now a substantial part of our annual business plan. <clears throat> so we recommend that as our local ski industry um, feels the effects of climate change and becomes more reliant on these summer crowds, um, it's important that they consider not only an increase in temperature and a shift in the shift in precipitation, uh, how that affects their winter sports opportunities, but also um, we feel they need to create an adaptation plan on how those conditions could affect um, their expanding summer offerings as well. I don't know that that's really discussed. Um, but CBMR is solely. Uh, solely investing in their shoulder and summer seasons um, in, a, in a variety of ways, um, including like lift assisted downhill mountain biking, uh, expanding uh, <coughs> their hiking trails and maintenance on those, uh, as well as zip lining, mini golf, music venues, and so on. They're just trying to um, add these other things to draw people into the area. Um, they're also dipping into um, holding off-season events or shoulder season events, um, such as like I think there is snowmobile race coming up next weekend. Um, definitely not in the direction we are uh, recommending. Uh, it's not really solving the other issue, but <laughs> um, but that that is one way that they're um, trying to draw people in during those times. Um, and we've also found uh, that several several of the resorts that we interviewed are making things changes as we discussed. Um, an increase in the length of stay of vacationers will help to generate revenue value-wise. Um, in, in a longer stay, um, each visitor uh, can experience you know, more and, and maybe some things beyond just me. Um, the resorts must also be flexible with their winter season dates as they experience a decrease in snowfall. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities on how to do this. We saw one example with a bad path, it's closed, um, or uh, having later um, opening and closing dates, or just waiting until the conditions are right. Um, the off seasons or shoulder seasons are starting to grow, so it would be wise to create more of these off offerings, which they are starting to look at. Um, the Crested View Chamber of Commerce is working on, um, as far as Venice Valley, uh, is working on creating more unique summer events and happenings in the valley, and they're using social media outreach uh, to communicate and draw more visitors into those shoulder and summer seasons. Uh, they believe that visitors will come here uh, to escape the heat and smog of other places, uh, which could unfortunately uh, increase hours here in the valley. So that uh, is an issue that we're looking at. Um, so our recommendations for the Gunnison Valley as a whole includes diversifying the local economy um, to make it less dependent on snow sports during the winter, uh, maybe even an economy less dependent on recreation um, in general so that we aren't so severely affected if we a decrease in recreational tourism. Um, and finally, an increase in alternative guest transportation in and out of the valley. That would help alleviate traffic and parking issues as well as pollutants from the upper that traffic. And I don't know if anyone has anything else to add to the recommendations. Yeah. Any questions? <coughs>
qualitative correlation between um, winter tourism employment, employment and the states that are really taking lead <coughs> around some of these issues? Um, no. No. <laughs> I would say that the states that are taking leadership, well, I don't think Colorado is doing it as much as they can. California has been doing a lot. That's actually where POW has started and is based. Um, and I would say that their mission has been really policy focused. They're trying to uh, change, like, top down change, but also by engaging uh, the snow community around having these folks, people that are athletes. So I think that um, they've been successful in reaching younger audiences. I'm not sure if they're really reaching the audiences that would maybe pay, be paying the most attention to these economic effects. That's one kind of um, weakness I see in their model. You know, they're trying to be cool and young, which is great, but a lot of the people that either are in decision-making capacity or really serve to lose from economic loss are maybe not as engaged in that in their audience space. I don't know if that really answers your question, but part of what they did in their study was they looked at a period from 1999 to 2010, which were the two lowest snow years and the two highest snow years, and then they compared those to find the differences would be in high snow years and low snow years. And another question, um, I think I think the ski area has a has a huge challenge right a, a, a ahead of them, in that the industry depends on folks to travel you know from far away, either take flights from you know domestically or abroad or you know drive multiple you know miles as well from from a major urban area out to this to, to, to the ski area, um, and all of this generates greenhouse gas emissions right that and then as well as the industry as a whole, I think, um, and really a lot of the, uh, the skiers per se, um, you know, perhaps they, they change out their their, their 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 attire right seasonally, and they probably have a Monday through Sunday uh, ski pants and ski jacket, right? So, I, and all of this is generating impacts outside, right, of, of the area. Um, so, is there any any incentive? Um, or any leadership that the that the industry could take on to perhaps you know curb some of these additional emissions occurring from transportation and just the consumption of crap. That's like well, it's interesting you brought that up. Autumn Schindler, the Aspen skiing company sustainability executive, um, he said that the demise of the ski industry is not going to be because of decrease in snowpack, but because of what happens to other economies. So can't afford to go to places like Aspen and Vail to go skiing. And he's like really the only person who's saying things like that. Um, so that's one opinion, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, and the, really the only thing that, as far as emissions and bringing people to the mountains happening is A Basin has discounted lift tickets if people carpool. And then things like CDMR is doing where they're trying to incentivize people to stay longer rather than like people coming from a really far distance for a weekend is like to get people here and have them stay here. So that's kind of like, but that's not very much what they're doing. And I don't think that that's one thing that definitely isn't really being addressed that much is there's huge emissions just getting people there. And that's like, I think all the resorts are kind of like. You're talking about zero emissions reduction too. So there, that's been really focused. So you know, we're doing you know, efficient snowmaking and all these, look at what we're doing, but it's not really relevant to their business model down the road. It's like, yeah, it's great and you're saying money pollution, but it's not really hidden and it's shitty stuff. So. And on that note, two things. One, John Sale, when I interviewed him, he said yes, he believes that climate change will absolutely influence his business. Is it part of their everyday decisions? No. Like their everyday decisions are customer focused. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's also a shift in that thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so he's totally aware of it, but he's also like, you know, this isn't what we talk about when we have our business meetings and discuss PM. Um, on the <coughs> aspect of transportation, we did do some brainstorming among us, not saying that these things are necessarily happening on a broader scale. I mean, it's great what um, Rafael Basin is doing, but we really need to buy in from like an entity like Bay for example. Like, what if they all had a bus that went directly from the Denver airport that left the school and brought people there and then prevented that much driving? Or what if all the ski resorts in the front of Green 
and you got into a train or a high-speed bus that could get, go up I-70. Um, we actually brainstormed some ideas of um, CBMR has been expanding their regional offerings, people are now on the front lane <coughs> pass, maybe trying to offer greater bus service for the front lane that's more convenient, or as it is, there's not a bus that works with the timing of the flights to get up to Crescent View if you want to take a bus up there. So trying to coordinate all our efforts locally to try and make um, <coughs> trips to the mountain as efficient as possible. That also speaks to you know where people can live um, and the distance that employees have to travel. And most ski resorts experience an online where people deliver in the ways they can't afford to live close to the resort. So maybe it's part of an adaptation strategy would be pre-planning and creating housing for employees that are close to the resort to reduce travel. One quick question that we have to ask. Oh, yes. Did you find anything out? You dive into the simulating world of, of ski areas and your role in that? That's like one thing that's mentioned as like uh, something that's very powerful is they have efficient snowmaking. But we didn't really get into like the whole water use, like the timing of that. So it's definitely something that they like to broadcast is they have really efficient but they don't really address like how long into the future that may be effective depending on water supply. So the power board does say that is what's happening, especially in the West, is that nighttime temperatures are getting warmer, faster than daytime temperatures, and that's when you make snow, so it's harder to make snow and more energy intensive as the nighttime temperatures warm, you get minimum temperature and it'll make snow. Um, John Snell did say like, you know, we could get all new snowmaking equipment for a million dollars and be as efficient as possible, but we just can't afford that very um, And they try to, they increase their snowmaking efficiency by 20%. Um, but you know, there are years when they pull all the ones of the East River. I'm not saying they're pulling over what they're allowed, but it's like the flows are different and maybe they're allowed to serve it on CFS, but that's taking it down below where it needs to be. So there maybe needs to be more conversation of, okay, if it's a drought year, then you can't just have the same amount. Mike Nathan at A Basin was really concerned about it because they have a much smaller system and they really rely on that. Um, they rely on the natural snow a lot more than a lot of other resorts, so they're kind of really involved a lot in this conversation. I think but they do talk. They all talk about snow making as a big part of other efficiencies. And CBMR and their expansion plans purposely chose to not expand into the region. River area because of the amount of requirement for snow making it would take. Like that's why they're looking at other areas where there's more natural snow. Right. Nice job.